Welcome to our second lecture covering module six, the module that covers race and color discrimination. In our first module, we did a very brief overview of the history of Title VII. We talked about what race is from a biological standpoint, as well as how it's defined in various statutes. And we discussed what racial discrimination looks like under Title VII. In this presentation, we're gonna talk about racial harassment, uh, sections 1981 and 1983. And finally, we'll briefly discuss color discrimination. So let's get started. So racial harassment is exactly what you think it is. It is a category of racial discrimination. And in this situation, somebody is abusive to a person based upon his or her race. Uh, just like all of our other claims, we've got a prima facie case to contend with. The elements of the prima facie case are different for racial harassment than we saw for racial discrimination, but the concept is the same. These are things that the plaintiff has to prove, has to make an initial showing for before the ping pong ball bounces to the defendant to explain uh, uh, a reason for what happened and then goes back to the plaintiff for a rebuttal. So what are the elements of the prima facie case of racial harassment? Well, the first thing you have to show is that the harassment was unwelcome. You may say, well, duh, of course harassment is unwelcome. And certainly in the racial harassment area, that's probably a pretty darn easy situation or claim to uh, prove. Um, we can see though in the area of sexual harassment, uh, there can be workplaces where there's a uh, sexual banter going on and everybody is consenting and participating and, and having maybe a fun time with it. And so then you could say in a sexual harassment situation, that behavior, if everybody's enjoying it, isn't unwelcome. Obviously, it's much more difficult to uh, find a racial harassment or, or a, a religious harassment or age harassment situation as, as welcome. But even there, you could imagine a situation where people uh, are constantly teasing each other and uh, making comments and maybe saying things that, uh, you know, if you were to look at the actual transcript would appear to be highly offensive, but in the banter of this particular workplace, um, it's all in good fun. So yes, it is necessary that it be unwelcome to be harassment, but obviously you know, that's not gonna be uh, an issue. It will obviously be unwelcome. The uh, harassment has to be based upon race. So the fact that I happen to dislike somebody and that person happens to be of a different race than me doesn't make it racial harassment. Um, I have to be acting that way towards him or her because of his or her race. Okay, that usually is pretty obvious under the circumstances because racial epithets are being used or racial offensive racial stereotypes are being shared. Um, so that usually isn't difficult to prove. This next one though is the one that usually or oftentimes is the one difficult for plaintiffs to prove. It has to be so pervasive, excuse me, severe or pervasive that it alters the conditions of employment and creates an abusive environment. So one comment, even when it's really offensive, is probably not going to satisfy this requirement. Um, usually you're going to see a pattern of this type of behavior. Um, we're not talking about uh, something that somebody said that was gauche or not politically correct or something along those lines. The bar is quite a bit higher to reach a level of racial harassment. So many things that you and I would look to and say, boy, that was out of line, boy, that was not appropriate, aren't going to raise to the level of racial harassment. Finally, there needs to be a basis for imposing liability on the employer. Now, can you sue the individual who's harassing you based upon your race? Of course. But again, that individual um, has two limitations. First of all, that person probably doesn't have a deep pocket. So there isn't a lot of legal purpose in suing somebody who doesn't have money because the main thing we get out of the court system is money. The second reason why suing individuals isn't that satisfying is that the individual can't solve the problem. Uh, the individual isn't gonna change the policy in a corporation. 
Um, so you really want to sue the employer directly. And when I say the employer, I don't mean the boss. I mean the entity that employs both the boss and, and the harasser and the harassed individual. Again, because the employer, that entity, that corporation in most cases, is going to have pretty deep pockets. And that employer is able to change the circumstances of employment so that, that behavior doesn't continue. So we're going to talk about this one in a a lot more detail when we get to the sexual harassment unit because this same prima facie case if we change racial harassment to sexual harassment we have the basis for sexual harassment when it is hostile work environment obviously we'd have to change this to sex as well obviously both of these are, are vocabulary terms so if you haven't already add them to your quiz So um, a little differently than when we talk about racial discrimination is that there really isn't the need to show a financial loss. In fact, in many cases, the employee won't have suffered any financial loss because he or she may still be employed by the employer. He or she has put up with a racially harassing environment and has continued the employment and hasn't been demoted, hasn't lost hours, hasn't been denied a promotion but there is no need to prove financial loss. Now, of course, if the employee has proved, proven a financial loss, then very likely he or she is going to have a racial harassment claim as well as a racial discrimination claim. And obviously that makes the claim more financially lucrative. Um, employers can be directly liable. So this, this one becomes easy to prove. Number four becomes easy to prove if the person is harassing is a supervisor, and um, if your boss is harassing you, then um, that person is acting as an agent of the employer with respect to your employment. So it's very easy to substantiate that the employer is acting, even if the employer didn't know about the harassing behavior, and even if the employer has a strong anti-harassment policy. Um, but many times harassment isn't by the boss, it's by coworkers or customers or third parties um, that, that might be engaging in the behavior. And under those circumstances, it is more difficult for the victim of the harassment to prove that the employer is ultimately or vicariously liable for the behavior. It's not an automatic situation. So, what the way this plays out is that the employer if the employer is smart will have developed a harassment policy the harassment policy will probably mainly be focused on sexual harassment but it will talk about other types of harassment as well including racial harassment and it will uh, train its workforce that harassment is not acceptable it will train the workforce in how to identify harassment and what to do if a person observes harassment, report it, in other words. And the idea is everyone should report, not just the victim, but anybody who sees something. Kind of the old saying, if you see something, say something. That's the rule for harassment situations. Um, and uh, employers will have a variety of mechanisms that that person can use to lodge the complaint because different people have different comfort levels. And obviously you aren't going to, if you're in the situation where the person who you're supposed to report the harassment to is the harasser, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So usually there's somebody in HR that you can go to to report harassment. And then there's usually someone in the chain of command, your direct supervisor or one or two levels up from there. A lot of larger companies also have 1-800 numbers. Many times these are manned by people who don't even work for the employer that um, are in a, you know, a call bank somewhere who take down the information. Um, and then it is, of course, relayed to uh, somebody within the organization. It is even sometimes possible within these organizations to do this anonymously. Um, so that way, um, a person who is reluctant to as associate his or her name with it can still make the company aware of the issue. So then the employer finds out about the issue, then the employer has a responsibility to promptly investigate the issue. And this obviously involves interviewing folks for the most part. Sometimes there's an email trail or a uh, 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 video camera or some type of camera that will show the particular incident that might have happened. And um, uh, 
then the employer will need to reach a decision about how to proceed. If the allegation is supported by evidence, then likely there will be some disciplinary action against the individuals who engaged in it, up to and including dismissal. A dismissal isn't necessarily the right solution in every single case. Um, it may be a situation where education is appropriate um, or suspension or something along those lines. But no matter what the consequence is, um, the fact that the investigation needs to be carefully documented, not just that it happened, but who was interviewed, ideally statements should be um, uh, collected from individuals and the outcome of the investigation ought to be written up. Um, even if it is determined that um, you can't really, you're not sure if it happened or not, but there's a variety of different perspectives and they are consistent and you're just not sure if the incident happened or didn't happen. Still, it should be documented in the personnel file because if I am accused of racially harassing and yet my manager thinks or whomever's investigating it thinks maybe it didn't happen. Still, it's best to document it to demonstrate that I was reminded about the policy and that if in six months there's another allegation against me, that might tend to add more weight um, if I've had this other warning, for one thing, it's clear that I know about the policy because I've been warned and that's been documented in my file. And number two, it's looking more and more like perhaps I did engage in that earlier behavior since I seem to have a repeated circumstance here. So the employer can avoid liability by taking all of these actions that I mentioned. And the standard here is that they are using, the employer is using prompt, corrective remedial action to address the problem. And prompt means, you know, that day. If you find out about um, a harassment uh, allegation before lunchtime, then before five o'clock that day, you need to be investigating the case, not necessarily you personally, but somebody in the organization needs to be investigating it. Definitely 24 hours ought not go by unless it's a weekend and that place of, of employment is closed for the weekend. Um, so generally speaking, prompt means very, very prompt. Um, and then of course, uh, the, the investigation may well take more than a day depending on people's work shifts and availability, but it should proceed very, very quickly, as quickly as it's reasonable to do so under the circumstances. And then I would say the corrective remedial action should happen. Even after the uh, corrective remedial action happens, it's important that the victim of the harassment is contacted periodically. So a good practice for the HR manager is to calendar at the time that the closing of the investigation happens to calendar maybe a week later or and then a month later and then three months later and then six months later to touch base with that person in a confidential way stop by or invite that person to um, the, uh, the, the supervisor's office and say, hey Bob, just wanted to touch base and make sure that the problems you were having in the past haven't uh, returned and get Bob's confirmation that the problems haven't returned or if the answer is, well, yeah, they have returned, then get more specifics about that situation. Um, and then of course, these conversations do need to be documented. And here you're documenting kind of two things. You're documenting that you followed up, you were making sure that you were taking remedial action that solves a problem, not just temporarily, but for the long haul. Number one and number two, you're hoping to hear, maybe you won't, but you're hoping to hear the problem solved. And so if Bob at some time in the future claims that you know, the problem did continue, you can refer to your notes and say, well, Bob, that's not what you told me on this date at this time. And of course, if the problem has returned, this gives you an opportunity to solve it. Um, when the matter is closed, um, you should uh, circle back with Bob and let him know the findings of the investigation. You don't necessarily have to give all the details of the discipline that the person received. For example, if the person has been dismissed, it can be something as simple as uh, uh, Larry is no longer employed by the company any longer. Bob will be able to connect the dots, obviously, but it's not necessary to say we fired Larry. Um, if there were some other uh, disciplinary action that Larry received, um, it may not be necessary to share that, but you should always tell Bob we have retrained Larry, 
in the um, uh, our harassment policy, and we're confident that he won't let that behavior resurface. But if he does, please come to see me, or and then give give the Bob some other names that he might be able to see. So if an employer takes all of those steps, then guess what? There is not going to be a basis for imposing liability on the employer. And even though Bob was the victim of racial harassment, a smart employer can significantly reduce the likelihood of liability by having that program in, in effect, communicating it to employees, ideally in the new hire process and periodically afterwards, and by having that prompt investigation. Those are uh, some, some secrets to uh, making racial harassment much less likely to be expensive for the company. And also, and probably more important than just the expenses, you're taking care of your employees. You're making sure that your um, employees uh, are gonna feel safe and respected in the work environment. Um, the courts have generally recognized repeated demeaning racial statements as constituting sufficient proof to hold the employer liable for racial ha harassment. Again, it's gonna depend upon how frequent it happened, how demeaning the terms were, what the context of how they were said were, um, whether the um, uh, employee also engaged, the, the one who was complaining about the harassment, also engaged in similar types of comments. Rudeness, though, isn't harassment. Um, there is no civility code that has to be followed. So the fact that a boss is terse, rude, even a jerk, isn't going to mean that there's harassment. Uh, a boss who's a jerk to everyone definitely hasn't been guilty of racial harassment. So if the boss is, is offensive to white, his white subordinates and offensive to his black subordinates, there's no racial harassment claim at that point. We're also going to use an objective standard here. Um, we haven't talked as much about the objective standard here as we, we do in maybe some other classes. So let's just do a little bit of a refresher. This standard is oftentimes called the reasonable person standard. Now the reasonable person, you know, we all think of ourselves, I guess, as reasonable people, um, but manifestly we all aren't reasonable, right? There's some unreasonable people I've met in my life and I bet you have too. And so even those of us who think we're reasonable, which is probably 100% of us, are not always right. So this standard is not referring to a particular person. But what the jury is going to be asked to do is to have this mythical, reasonable person be the standard. Somebody of kind of average temperament, not super sensitive, not super uh, unsensitive, I guess. Uh, someone of, re of average intelligence, average life expect experience, average education, average sophistication. Just kind of a typical person. We will not use the plaintiff though for this role. So the plaintiff might be a very sensitive human being. The person plaintiff may have been have, may have had traumatic events in his life that make him or her especially sensitive to racially offensive comments. It is very hurtful for him or her to hear racially offensive comments, much more so than it might be to the average person. Unfortunately for the plaintiff, this isn't the standard. We're looking for the reasonable person standard. Um, you may have heard the term microaggressions. This is a term that sometimes is used in the workplace and elsewhere to refer to slight uh, uh, offensive things that happen that can be very painful for the person to whom it happens. For example, um, he's not invited to lunch with the other group of folks. Uh, maybe it was intentional, maybe just no one thought of inviting him. That's hurtful, but that's not going to make a racial harassment claim. Or he feels that um, he uh, doesn't get quite as glamorous a project um, sometimes as other coworkers. Uh, that might be a pretty subjective measurement. Um, or maybe he feels that he's interrupted more often in the meeting. You know, uh, that's kind of hard to quantify. It may be real, that may be hurtful, uh, but those are pretty slight types of things that, um, not trying to diminish them or say they don't happen or say they aren't painful, but those aren't the things that 
the courts are going to be focusing on unless they are very, very pervasive um, and seem very, very intentional. So we're looking at the objective reasonable person standard, not a subjective standard, and not looking at the case through the plaintiff's eyes. And again, all the things we've talked about is the same model that we're gonna look at when we talk about sexual harassment. And the, the two cases that are important for sexual harassment are Farragher and Ellerth. And they're usually referred to together, Farragher, Ellerth. Um, and uh, even though we don't have a racial harassment case that's kind of the big deal, we don't need one because Farragher and Ellerth uh, perform that function. Even though their topic is sexual harassment, it also works for the racial harassment category. Let's consider this scenario. M Mary was racially harassed by a coworker. Her employer responded immediately by investigating the situation reprimanding the harasser and conducting meetings to make sure everyone was on board with the company's policy. After all this happened, there was no more harassment. Under these circumstances, the employer probably doesn't have any um, liability because it acted promptly and the fourth element of the prima facie case wasn't satisfied. So Mary's a flight attendant. She's the only African American on her airplane. Her coworkers um, used racial slurs and threats against her. It's obviously a very hostile and stressful situation. Um, she's not able to tolerate this the circumstance anymore, so she quits her job. Under these circumstances, Mary may have a cause of action for racial harassment. What we don't have in this situation is an explanation for why Mary didn't report this behavior. And so it's not 100% clear whether um, this fourth element is satisfied. Now, I don't know the reporting relationship within an airline. There may be a head flight attendant on every flight, and if that's not Mary, and that um, lead flight attendant was participating in this behavior, then yes, there will be liability for the airline. Uh, or even if the head uh, flight attendant perhaps didn't participate in it, but was aware of it, observed it, and didn't do anything about it. So very likely there will be a responsibility for the employer. But again, there is some responsibility on Mary to bring it to the attention of management. This is one Mary there. Okay, some employees, we're gonna assume for this story that they are from a different culture. They're very clueless. Maybe they were raised on a deserted island somewhere <laughs> anyway. They hang in news at work as a joke. Hard to imagine anybody thinking that's remotely funny, but in, well, we're gonna pretend that these individuals uh, are from a different culture and so that they don't understand the significance of this. Anyway, um, they they're directing it at, at some coworkers who lost a Super Bowl bet. Bob, who is an African-American employee, obviously the news has a lot of significance to him for historical reasons, and he's intimidated. He's concerned about his personal safety, and he reports the incident to, manager, to management, which is obviously what he ought to do. The company immediately investigates, finds out that these employees had no notion uh, about the history of the news, and the, uh, the perpetrators do apologize, and the company communicates to all employees that this was completely inappropriate and cannot be repeated. There's no more harassment. Under these facts, even though it was a very alarming circumstance, um, I don't think that Bob would be able to prove racial harassment. So it doesn't appear that the actions was racially motivated. And of course, management took immediate corrective action. And I'm gonna say a noose in the workplace is usually probably going to satisfy racial harassment because that's obviously a very uh, physically intimidating thing to have in the workplace and it has a very strong racial um, meaning to it in many cases, or I would say in almost all cases. So um, usually this would be probably enough in and of itself to make a racial harassment claim. Now we're gonna talk about sections 1981 and 1983, mainly 1981. We've talked a little bit about this one before, but I just wanna do a little bit of a refresher. This is very similar to the racial protections that exist under Title VII except it's better for plaintiffs than Title VII. So this has to do with race-based claims, so it's limited to that, and some courts extend it to national origin-based claims. 
So it's not going to help the plaintiff who's advancing an age claim or religion claim or a sex claim or a disability claim, but it will help race-based and, and probably color-based and perhaps national origin claims. It also only pertains to disparate treatment. It's not going to uh, relate to disparate impact situations. So let's examine why Section 1981 should definitely be in the arsenal of any plaintiff side employment law offer. So um, uh, there is no requirement to exhaust administrative remedies before filing a lawsuit. And that's again, typically what has, has, what has to be done for Title VII and under many state laws as well, including the Texas state law. Um, most people are going to go ahead and use the administrative procedures so that they can sue under 1981 and Title VII. But if for some reason the statutory period has expired to file your uh, charge of discrimination, you still have Section 1981 as a backup. Um, there is a longer statutory period. Again, under Title VII, you have in a state uh, with, that has a 706 uh, FEP agency, you have 300 days. But I think you have four years for Section 1981, so significantly longer. There's also no cap on punitive and compensatory damages under Title VII. I'm sorry, under Section 1981, there is a cap for compensatory and punitive damages under Title VII. There is no cap for actual damages, say lost pay, but usually um, a significant part of the money that plaintiffs are looking to, to, to acquire or to get is going to be for compensatory and punitive damages. The absolute maximum allowed under Title VII uh, for punitive and compensatory damages in combination is $300,000. Under Section 19.1, there is no cap, so you can see dramatically more money potentially available under Section 1991. Um, and non-employers may be um, defendants in a Section 1981 claim. There are a couple of uh, drawbacks, though, to Section 1981. First of all, we already talked about it doesn't protect in um, other situations uh, outside of the race scenario, and it doesn't apply if the federal government is your employer. So let's consider this situation. Um, this is actually, I guess, the name of Cracker Barrel, I guess. Cracker Barrel is the CB here. So um, the answer here is yes. Does Section 1981 forbid retaliation against an individual who, claim, who complains of discrimination against others? So Mr. Humphreys is an African-American a manager at a Cracker Barrel. He was doing great in his job until a supervisor changes. The supervisor starts using racial slurs and um, his performance appraisals plummet. Um, Mr. Humphreys uh, complains uh, within his organization and he's criticized because he goes outside of his management group. Well, that's the whole reason to have a complaint process, right? And uh, he's ultimately dismissed and he claims he was dismissed in part because of his race, but also because he made complaints because he saw another African-American employee who was also dismissed for race reasons. Okay, so, and by the way, the slides are a little bit about out of order, so uh, what you're seeing perhaps is out of order within your notes. So eventually it gets up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court says, yes, Section 91, 1981 does cover retaliation. Um, you do not need to know this case. Or it's holding. It's a good example of a case, but I don't... There we go. And again, here's a, a two, three minute long uh, summary of the case when it, when it was heard, when, it, when the decision came down by the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, so let's flip to 1983. This is when there's the requirement of some state action. And here we're talking about states in the sense of 
Texas or Louisiana or Massachusetts or whatever, not the government, but just the state or local government. Um, so you, you need to have some state action, not just purely um, uh, private action or action by the federal government. Um, and this, again, prohibits race discrimination. Okay, so let's talk about color discrimination. So first of all, many times we conflate race and color discrimination into the one thing, but they are separate terms. Now, obviously they're closely related and um, most plaintiffs, if they're uh, thinking it through carefully, if they have a race discrimination claim, they will also assert a color discrimination claim. And if they have a color discrimination claim, most likely they have a race discrimination claim too. It's hard to think of cases where you wouldn't allege both. Um, you, you, uh, you will usually find that the more uh, theories you can advance when you file your charge of discrimination, you file your lawsuit, the better you will be. You can always dismiss claims that you ultimately conclude the evidence doesn't support but it can sometimes be difficult or even impossible to add claims. So let's consider, we have a definition here for color. This is under Title VII. This refers to the pigmentation, complexion, or skin shade or tone. So again, we're talking about the color of the skin. Um, so this doesn't deal with eye color or hair color or something like that. This is dealing with skin color. And of course, color discrimination is discrimination related to color, right? And it occurs when someone is discriminated against because of their skin tone. And again, a person can be discriminated against because that person has a light skin tone or because that person has a dark skin tone. Or it could just be a different shade of skin tone, maybe neither darker nor lighter. So Mary is a light complexioned African American. She receives more job offers than other darker African-Americans of her acquaintance. Um, I was just reading today an article about the life of Mariah Carey, and she spoke at length about her struggles with uh, skin color. Um, as I'm sure you know, uh, Mariah Carey is brought biracial, and um, it, the way she described it was that she's two tones too light to be considered African-American, and she's two tones too dark to be considered white. And so it's been a struggle for her and in those areas because she doesn't quite fit into either one of those categories. So um, again, being light or being dark can, can both be problematic for individuals. Um, so if a person alleges race discrimination in his or her lawsuit or in his or her charge of discrimination in front of the EOC, um, uh, and the matter concludes or, or progresses beyond a certain point, that the courts don't necessarily have to permit him or her to add color discrimination later on. Similarly, if the person starts with color discrimination and chooses to add race discrimination later on, the court may preclude that. There have been cases where somebody filed a charge of discrimination asserting only race or color and later on when he filed his lawsuit wanted to add the other category and the court wouldn't let him because he hadn't administratively exhausted that claim. So um, it is an important thing to keep in mind to check both boxes on the EOC form. The EOC has reported that color bias claims have been increasing in recent years. Uh, this type of discrimination can occur between ethnic groups so for example, a person harassing, I'm sorry, harassing, discriminating can be of a different race than the victim, or they both can be of the same race. Um, either way is, uh, can, can occur. So let's look at what a prima facie case of color discrimination will be. And again, it's following the same prima facie case recipe that we talked about earlier on. So the first thing we have to show is that this person is a member of a protected group. In other words, this person has a particular shade of skin color. It might be a dark-skinned African-American. It might be a light-skinned Indian. It might be, a, you know, any shade, obviously, it can be relevant. So 
Um, obviously, we all have some color, um, and so everybody's protected in some sense of this category. This person has to experience an adverse employment action. It could be failure to hire, it could be failure to promote, it could be a demotion, it could be um, a dismissal. All those are possibilities. The uh, person needs to show that he or she was qualified for the job. And again, this one is the other category, but usually it's going to be that they were replaced or the, the person who was ultimately hired was a person of a different skin tone. So if I am an African American with a dark skin tone, I apply for a job, I don't get it, I've proven my first two elements, I was qualified for the job, I'm doing great on my prima facie case, but the person who's ultimately hired actually has a darker complexion than I do, or an equally dark complexion, under those circumstances, I'm probably not going to be able to make my prima facie case. Um, so that's the same process that we look to. And as we've seen with uh, the prima facie case, then of course the employer has the opportunity to respond and say, well, let's say instead of it being a darker, darker complected person, then it's a lighter complected person, either who's African American or of a different race. Well, then the, the uh, a defendant employee, employer can say, yes, but that person had more qualifications. That person had a PhD, whereas the plaintiff only had a master's degree, for example. And so then the ball bounces back to the plaintiff to show that that was just a pretext. So Mary's a light complexion African American. She's the manager of the cosmetics department. She chooses not to promote Susan, who has a darker complexion, but is also African American, when they're, um, even though Susan would be the kind of logical candidate to promote. And the reason that Mary decides not to promote Susan is that Mary believes customers prefer lighter skinned salespeople. And of course, customer preference can never be a factor in color and race discrimination. And in fact, it usually can't be a factor in any type of discrimination unless there's an issue of personal modesty or um, there's an issue of, of religious requirements like we see with certifying things as kosher. Under these circumstances, Susan does have a strong claim for color discrimination, even though Mary, the person who passed her over for the job is also African-American. So Maria is a brown-skinned Latina who works as a waitress at a local restaurant. She works the morning shift, which is her preferred shift. She's assigned to the night shift after Juliana, a light-skinned Hispanic, um, is hired. Uh, Maria uh, points to, shows the manager that the company policy is that new employees are always assigned the night shift, and the longer service employees get the day shift. Well, the manager says, well, I'll switch you and Julia around if Maria, if Maria, if you will improve your complexion. Well, there's nothing wrong with Maria's complexion. It just happens to be browner than Julia's, Juliana's. So under those situations, uh, Maria can bring a claim of a color discrimination. I would also, especially if the supervisor isn't a Latina or Latino, I would also recommend that Maria bring a national origin claim and possibly a race discrimination claim. So um, let's, so now we've covered all of our topics in this module. We've talked about a little bit of history and the definition of terms. We've talked about racial discrimination, both disparate treatment and disparate impact, as well as association discrimination. We've talked about racial harassment, uh, the night sections 1981 and 1983, and we've discussed color discrimination. So let's look over some pointers or takeaways that you may want to keep in mind. Um, be sure that you take complaints of racial discrimination seriously. You may assume that those types of issues don't continue at, in, in the 21st century, but they absolutely do, and they can happen, and um, if managers aren't paying attention to them carefully, they will, um, they quite possibly will happen. You need to take quick um, and decisive action to avoid liability and to solve the problem. Um, you also need to be sure that um, you facilitate reconciliation within a department so that people can have a, 
uh, a little bit more empathic understanding of each other's circumstances and positions. Sometimes people are clueless and they don't understand what they're doing is offensive. And so sometimes just saying, hey, you know what? That may not be what you intended that symbol to mean, but it's how another person might reasonably interpret that symbol. Consider offering some type of training to workers so that they can become more aware of the experiences of other people and develop a greater sensitivity. And then of course, you always have to monitor the work environment. The managers and supervisors need to be present, need to be around people, need to be available to hear complaints. They need to be in a position where they can see where the problems are and address them as quickly as possible. If you have any questions, as always, please feel free to stop by and see me. I hope that this information has been helpful and I hope that you have a wonderful day. Take care.